Hi, our next interview is with uh, John Curtis of the Book Press in Williamsburg, Virginia. And John, I'm going to start off by asking you what I ask everyone. Tell us a little bit about your family background, uh, what your parents did, uh, siblings, uh, what you did as a young person. Uh, pretty much give us a little biopic through uh, your graduation from college if you went to college. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Waterbury, Connecticut, and then Middlebury. Um, I had one brother who was less than a year uh, younger uh, than I was. I was born uh, in 1940, so uh, my father was um, off in uh, war, etc. Oh, really? And uh, but came back, um, uh, you know, earlier. Uh, so I, as a kid, I really. Uh, enjoyed, I don't know, putting on little play circuses, things like that. Mm. I can remember, um, you know, doing, I got a, a camera for Christmas from my grandmother that could show films. And so that was always a part. I had a paper route um, <laughs> for, um, and when I was maybe, I guess, in fifth or sixth grade, uh, would uh, bicycle around mm -hmm. delivering the papers in my neighborhood. Went, went, went away to school um, for high school up in northern part of Connecticut to Pomfret. Uh, and then... The Pomfret uh, School? Yeah, Pomfret School. I didn't know that Charlie Wood was there at the time. Oh, would Otherwise, that have made a difference? I, I, yeah, and it was before I was. I mean, I always collected uh, little things in books. I guess as a kid, um, I, I did do something with baseball cards, but mostly I was really taken by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And I used to doodle and try to get architecture mm, magazines yeah. and things. I always had a... That was a, your big interest. I, I always had an interest very young in that. I didn't major in it in college, but I minored in it. And um, it was always a part of my life that way. What did you do when you got out of college? Um, because I didn't know um, what I was going to do. And um, because it was the first year of the Kennedy administration. Sure. I went into the Peace Corps. I went to Borneo, to Sarawak. Um, now, when I went there first, it was still a British protectorate, uh, and it was turned over and became a part of Malaysia uh, while I was still there as a volunteer. Oh. I came back, and um, I worked in Sergeant Shriver's office uh, for a year and then went back um, as a regional director. I was over in um, Malaya, then negotiating with the government for where Peace Corps volunteers could go. Could go. And came back um, uh, in, I guess it would have been 80, uh, excuse me, would have been um, Oh, year now, yeah, a eighty-seven, I think. No, no, I'm I'm getting confused here. Sixty-seven. Sixty-seven more. Yeah, right. and um, I I worked for a year Peace Corps Washington. Since I was the youngest, um, I was deputy director for uh, public affairs and did congressional relations. And since I was the youngest guy there, when the SDS uh, challenged the Peace Corps about whether if you disagreed with your government on Vietnam, you could go in. They sent me out uh, to uh, Berkeley to debate with the SDS. <laughs> yes. And that was when I met um, Al Lowenstein. Really? Uh, and so I left the Peace Corps, went over, ran Al's office for about a year and a half or two. He was, of course, had gotten elected from Long Island. Yeah. Um, and that was how I met Marsha Carter, was a volunteer, and Larry uh, 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 McMurtry was going around with her. And when Al lost um, the election after I went with Larry to see the 
final filming of the last picture Thank show. Um, I came back. I knew myself well enough. Julia really didn't like my wife, didn't yeah. like Washington so much. And I promised her we'd find some place uh, <laughs> to go that uh, she might teach and um, do some things. But to keep myself out of trouble, that was when the three of us actually uh, started uh, booked up in Georgetown for a while. And I knew I was going to be moving. So within yeah. a year, um, we found a place um, outside of Williamsburg on the James River, I got, went to Williamsburg. They said I could have a little shop, because <laughs> in those days, you could have an open shop. Yeah. Uh, I think my first rent was $350 a month. <laughs> in Williamsburg, uh, to, in, wow. You know, right in, in the, center, uh, of in the uh, center of things in that Merchant Square area, that Colonial Williamsburg, that the Rockefellers had built this uh, sort of um, Neo-Georgian yeah. place. And, and you're still in the same place? No, not now. I mean, I was a couple of places um, in Colonial Williamsburg because I needed more space. But ultimately, and I opened a restaurant um, at, at the same time with a chef who had been uh, at Colonial Williamsburg called the Trellis. The Trellis. And we you get your uh, plug for that. We had that for almost 30 years. And something I did learn one thing in college, and that was that I shouldn't sign another lease and still own a restaurant by the time I was 80. So <laughs> two years ago, uh, managed to um, uh, sell it to a local chef and some backers with and Marcel, who was the executive chef, wanted uh, out of it yeah. too. Because it's a, a grueling business. Yeah, it's for young young people. Actually, it's I would um, think. yeah. I mean, I don't think we ever had um, a working chef who was expediting who was over forty five. I mean, it's like a football yeah. match, yeah. really. How, uh, how big a restaurant was it? I've heard varying opinions. Well, um, we we could seat two hundred and twenty five when we could use the outdoor cafe. And we were open lunch and dinner. We um, we made all our own everything: ice cream, breadsticks, bread. Um, I said Marcel, who was the culinary genius and who was a, a graduate of the Culinary Institute yeah. um, back when it was in New Haven, actually before it moved wow. up on the Hudson River. Um, that you know what we did. We did in volume because we had maybe 750, served 750, 800 people a day. Wow. Um, and trying to make your own uh, things. It, it was a, a uh, thing. And, and um, it was around that time that uh, John Ballinger, who had been with Bob Fleck at Oak Knoll and before that in North Carolina, joined uh, as a partner in the book press. And, when, uh, did you, when did you first get the book Bug? Well, I, separate from just getting things and being um, interested in, in books, I think when I first learned that there were first editions and uh, various things was when I was in college, wrote my honors thesis on um, a uh, novelist named Ford Maddox Ford, mm -hmm. Ford uh, Maddox Hufer, and it happened at the time that I was writing it that there were two assistant professors writing biographies of, the, of him, and they both had taken out most of the books that I wanted <laughs> as supplementary uh, things, the things that Ford had written on uh, what London was like and his, some of his philosophical views, they were out on long-term loan, so I had no um, recourse but to go out and haunt the bookshops of, of Boston. You know, and then I'd learn, oh, $2, this was a first edition and pretty early of uh, something that he had wrote about um, his Hufer family, which was so involved with Rossetti and yeah, uh, the, whole the whole, you know, pre-Raphaelite 
uh, part of it. Um, so that's probably when I uh, ha had the bug. And Was the first bookshop you opened the one in Williamsburg? Oh, well, the first one that I opened was with well, Larry and I'm, but, I'm but, sorry about but, but for Book Press, the first one was uh, in Williamsburg. And it's the one, you know, that I've had. Now I have a house about a mile outside of the colonial thing on Jamestown Road. Um, and people can come, but I don't have as many people coming in. Is it asking. an open shop? It's an open shop still. But honestly, you know, we mostly get visitors who know about us who are in town now, as opposed to the early days when the bus stop was not taking people around the Colonial <laughs> area. They'd exit, and uh, we had a little joke. We'd say, oh, here come the bus, and the people the would bus. run out of the shop. But uh, The good old days. It was, it was good, because in those days, I mean, in Williamsburg, there, were, there might have been one other secondhand bookstore, but um, people who were interested in history, design, and architecture, um, would come to visit, so we, that's how we developed uh, a mailing list and, and local customers, anyway. How big a staff do you maintain? Um, I, we, it, I've, we're less now. I was up to five at one point, and now, really, um, it's, there are three of us. Yeah, well, John, John's on time. John, passing, of course. Uh, yeah. It did have an effect. It, it did, definitely. As well as my old age, well, you know, because one of the good things about, but well, you can do it as you like to do it. I think that's that, that's, that's one of different. the <laughs> big things. And when you accumulate, I mean, I might have seven thousand books that are cataloged and still things that are in storage, some from collections back as far as when I got. Uh, the Jeffrey, you know, bought Jeffrey Steele's yeah. uh, collection together, which was ago. more than 20,000 yeah. books that uh, we moved down. I still have some of those, uh, you know, that aren't cataloged. He was, he was a, a very, uh, very good bookman. And he was, he was, and generous. Yeah, um, and with his knowledge as well as with yeah. his prices. I guess, um, you know, one of the things when I'm thinking of it as a business where people who were in the trade who were tremendously generous, both with their knowledge and um, in a sense of almost financing you in those days. Yeah. I mean, Jeffrey's uh, collection, uh, he allowed us to pay over three years back to him. And even somebody, um, like Ken Nebensaw, who just um, uh, sold out his private collection at auction. I can remember going and seeing him in the early days in Chicago yeah. and how look through maps and because we had a good walk in trade, yeah. how he let me um, get more maps than I would have been able to uh, afford and, right. and, and we set up a schedule to pay over a year. Uh, same thing with um, the long-term relationship that I had with Colin Franklin because I was always interested in the history of printing and so when he did that work on color printing in chiaroscuro, John and I, you know, bought that whole collection that had come back from um, an Israel museum that um, really somebody in South Africa who had bought the hmm. uh, collection of Kiriskiro from uh, Colin, um, and he, you know, again, extended credit for a long time. Yeah. Booksellers uh, helping booksellers. Yeah, and I mean, somebody you know in the early days, Rocky Gardner calling sure. me up, uh, St. John, John, uh, there's, there's going to be uh, a sale. The Garvins in Buffalo are, are selling their books. And of course, you know their, their, their furniture collection at Yale. And, 
Mm -hmm. You know, it, he, was, uh, he was one of the great book scouts. He really was. He really was. It was always uh, a, a great pleasure and a huge excitement. And again, he would help people. I mean, he loved to tell the stories about mm. a book. I have today um, at this New York book fair a um, uh, one of Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, copy of his first books, the um, uh, House Beautiful, that there were 90 copies uh, done in which uh, he designed all of the fretwork around uh, the text that was by um, Gannett, the Unitarian minister. And I remember a tiny one in the bottom of a huge pile of books in Rocky's barn, God. pulling it out. I mean, of course, it wasn't the most beautiful copy well. in the world, but it was complete. It needed a new binding, but taking it out and then uh, listening to Rocky, I said, go, how much was it, Rocky? And, uh, well, of course, John, you know, this is, he, he knew everything about it. And then he said, $28, you know. <laughs> he always so, liked, his prices usually ended in eights, as you, uh, yeah, I'm sure, I, I remember, know. and I don't know if you got there must have been any some, Americana some, from, but it was some psychological thing involved yeah, in with things, that. I don't know. Um, um, what percentage of your business comes from the internet, and what percentage would you say comes from a store, uh, catalogs, book fairs? Can you, in your mind, sort of compartmentalize? Well, I would say um, that of books under $500, um, we probably sell six or ten a week uh, over the internet. Um, I mean, it sometimes is different. Um, I mean, I have gotten orders for um, four and five figure books off of the internet, but that's very seldom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you break it down by dollar volume, I'd say that we still do um, maybe 40% of our business with institutions and collection building in areas. I mean, I still have um, librarians that either have uh, collectors groups or have meetings where they have an endowment where we, and here's where it's so much easier to search somebody's inventory oh, now where either we can offer individually things that we know will fit into their collection uh, or that we may suggest four or five books for a meeting that are coming out, up, send them out on approval and uh, have a high percentage of them, you know, if they uh, say they're interested, um, you know, I'd say most of them usually go. Then uh, probably tw another 20 or 25 percent from uh, shows and uh, whatnot, and another uh, 30 percent to individual collectors that I'm working with. How many sh uh, uh, book fairs do, does the book press do on an annual basis? Not uh, um, about three or four. You do New York? Do you we do? do New York, we do the California, and we usually do um, Boston. Um, I have done, but I'm not doing this year, London. Uh, and um, um, we do a couple of local yeah. fairs that we support. This year uh, we have a, um, the first, a, a local group of Virginia booksellers, which has maybe 12 of us or so are members of uh, the ABAA, but then the others are uh, in yeah. various levels. But we have probably 35 Virginia booksellers that are going to do something at the, um, the Library of Virginia, which will 
help them. It'll be yeah, be a nice. fundraiser. Their friends. It probably will be a thing of creating some awareness. It's uh, it's very important uh, for people to still continue to be interested in, in books. Right. Especially well, and for around. me, you know, I think you see um, changes in trends and changes in availability. And, you know, where when I started, um, you could see and possibly afford not being a, um, a, a powerhouse bookseller, right. Champlain's Voyages, yeah, or yeah. Debray, or the, all, you know, most of the major voyages that uh, uh, would be a part of the thing I've handled. But today, uh, I would say, like most of the institutions have uh, these major high spots, so they're going into the uh, private hands. They're beyond my reach, and I find institutions collecting trade catalogs or what might be considered ephemera, and some ephemera being quite rare and important, and so um, that's what's fun, uh, I think. Yeah, ephemera and, is fun. And to see new things that are available, you have to go to book fairs, really. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, as well as go around to shops, but... Such as they're open. Yeah, well, that's it. I was just talking with Charles Agnan about the, the old days when you could spend a whole day on 4th Avenue. Right. And now you could spend 20 minutes. That's and, true. And it's, uh, it's a whole part of our book history that doesn't exist anymore. No, that's, right. that's um, very, very true. The open shop was a place you could meet people, you could find things, you could sell things. Right. And it was all part of our trade, and now it's disappeared. Right. And even the grandest, um, you know, uh, would be welcoming if you made an appointment going to somebody like John Fleming, yeah. being able to see things, or to Colin Franklin's barn mm -hmm. out near Oxford. Um, I mean, those were all great experiences, as well as the shops that were just stuffed with uh, books. Uh, yeah. the, the, the I mean, that's a different, it's a different the situations. Whole, a whole different world. One last question. Uh, 30 minutes have gone by very rapidly. Uh, just just uh, can you briefly just give your opinion on the future of our trade? I mean, do we have a future? Uh, is it going to be a, a visual future? Is it going to be a, a, a first edition future? Uh, or is it going to be just paperbacks? No, I I think there is a future. I think even in the last um, four or five uh, years, I'm pleased to see um, that the ABAA has some younger members, people yeah. like Lauren Bear, people yeah. like Garrett Scott, um, and you know that there are book fairs that they can participate in. Not everybody necessarily spends the money to take a week in New York, which yeah. is, it's, it's it takes a lot more personal. and you have to do it. But you really see, um, you know, I think new trends of, that they carry on in social uh, history and um, maybe different movements that yeah. have been overlooked. Uh, so I think there'll always be something there. And I think there'll always, I, I think where there's, printed material that also has visual uh, impact. Th the image is so much a part of contemporary culture um, that I think it can be picked up and it's, it, it will, people will always want uh, some of that. I don't know what universities will do and libraries with their collections, but you know they may actually be as they have been, a source of disposing of, yeah. of things. The other side of the coin. You uh, know, yeah. it, it could come out of that. But, uh, well, John, our time has come to an end. I thank, thank you very you. much for participating. And uh, I thought it was a really good interview. Well, thank you. Thank you.